hello um, formally to everyone. Um, most of you will know me by now, but for those who are new to PACT, I'm Kate Loughlin, one of the PACT co-leaders. And I'm Sandra Scott, the other PACT co-leader. So welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, just a few items of housekeeping before we begin. So um, the session is being recorded so that we can actually uh, make it available later to those who couldn't make it. So um, those of you who are happy to be recorded, great, it's great to see you. Those who would prefer not to, please do uh, turn off your camera if you haven't already done so. Um, the we have one breakout session today that would be recorded, so please do feel free to um, speak as frankly as you want within your groups. Um, and can I remind people to please switch their microphones off unless they're speaking so that we can keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, Lee, um, as part of our team, is that your point of contact if you have any problems in terms of logistics or anything like that, please do contact her on chat. She's under EIS Union. Um, and uh, our session today, as usual, will be split into two parts with a five minute comfort break in the middle. So that should be around 2.30. Um, and just one last thing, please. Um, we're having a little activity in the second part um, that would require an A4 sheet. So we're at the break, if, if you have time to grab an A4 sheet or just something similar. Thank you. In our last module, um, we opened by saying that we were setting out our stall clearly and naming poverty as the problem, not those who endure it. For this module, we also want to set the tone right from the beginning with this quote. Thank you, Sandra. So this is a quote from Joseph Rosinski, um, who founded an anti-poverty and human rights charity called ATD Fourth World. And as you can see, it says, it is not poverty which is shameful, it is the existence of poverty which is shameful. We're using this because this reflects the culture change that we want to make in schools. We want to support a culture where no young person is ashamed of poverty, but where the responsibility and therefore any shame involved is put firmly where it belongs with those who create and sustain it. And here um, in the next slide is that quote embedded in principle and action. Here is that quote embedded in principle and action in another community and one with the pressure for people living there to be silent and invisible and it was and is an everyday occurrence. You can see the quote here um, above the door of this Glasgow based charity. This picture was taken a few years ago, just over a decade ago, a decade ago. And you may recognise one of the women in the front. We've included this here to remind us all that the issues we discussed today are not new, and that while we may give examples taken from the struggles in the time of the virus, they are only the visible tip of the poverty iceberg that lurks beneath the surface of our society. And one which, as we know, has been steadily growing for quite some time. All the people in this picture knew that then, and many other community members doing similar things know that now, and we'll see some of them later. But this also serves as a statement of intent, that as we've said before, and we'll say again, that throughout these modules, the role of community and of place in our young people's lives will be given the status and attention it deserves and needs to offer the kind of awareness, understanding and support that they need. Community organisations know how important working with schools is, but they need to be invited over the threshold. This group, for example, worked with both their local primary and secondary schools on an innovative poverty and education project more than a decade ago, including cost-saving recommendations and a programme of direct classroom work with, on poverty awareness with senior school pupils. So, however, in stepping back and intentionally directing our spotlight, and let's move on to the module introduction. Thank you. We focus today on recognising that poverty doesn't start in schools, as we know. And so if we are, able, we are to be able to really know and understand it, its nature, causes and consequences, we must first start by looking outside schools, at the society we all share and the overarching culture which we are all affected by and may help to perpetuate and recreate or change. We then want to bring that deepened understanding and awareness back into school by looking in the mirror. Let us reflect on what choices we've made in our practices and whether we want to make different choices. Choices within the varying degrees of agency that we all have. So 
looking again at what narrative do we communicate now and want to communicate in future to our young folk about poverty through both our words and deeds. Finally in this session, bringing both of these together, we start to look at what choices we could make in our individual and joint actions towards our shared goals and to further build our packed community, not just as an end in itself, but as a means to, to the genuinely positive destinations we all want for our children and young people. In doing so, we introduce the Delta symbol today, the mathematical symbol for change, as a visual representation of the change we all want to see on poverty in our schools. And you'll see that there in each section heading and here it's coming up on the aims. So if we bring the aims up, I'll give you a moment just to let you read these over by yourself. Let me also remind you that we recognise that you may have personal outcomes that you're hoping to achieve from this session and um, of, the, the, of the programme as a whole as well. And you may want to um, look at these before and after. So I'll just give you one more moment to do this and then we'll move on to say a wee bit more about the session plan from Sandra. Thank you. Hi everyone. So as Kate said, we are shining the spotlight on poverty. And we're going to we're going to begin um, just by sharing what you're going to experience in this session, just so you just so you feel nice and secure knowing what's ahead. So we're going to start by looking outside schools, seeing what's out there, and then looking back inside the education system, looking in the mirror. We're then going to take a break, and then we'll return to the societal situation, checking on the downpour, just to pick up on our previous storm metaphors. And then we're going to look at the issue of social class. And finally, we're going to spend some time thinking about building the packed community in terms of people, places and power. But first of all, we're going to start just with a five minute clip just to set the scene. So you may be aware of the, the report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in the UK. And so Philip Alston is about to share with you some of his findings from that report. The picture, however, is much more complex than just rattling off statistics. What has surprised me is the extent to which there is close to unanimity in terms of the observations by think tanks, by a lot of media commentators, by independent authorities like the National Audit Office, by a whole range of parliamentary committees and others, that poverty is really a major challenge in the United Kingdom and that not nearly enough is currently being done to address the challenges. On the other side, what I found in my discussions with ministers is basically a state of denial. The ministers with whom I met told me that things are going well, that they don't see any big problems and they are happy with the way in which their policies are playing out. But it's of course not the story that I heard in my travels through Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and in quite a few cities in England. What I saw, food banks, schools, community centres, job centres, libraries, and elsewhere is a lot of misery. A lot of people who feel that the system is failing them, a lot of people who feel that the system is really there just to punish them, people who feel that despite the fact that they are really down and need a little bit of help that they could always have counted on in yesterday's Britain, they're just not able to get. And so what I've tried to do in my report is to ask why? What's the motivation for the main policies that seem to be problematic in the benefits area? And the answer that most people come up with is, oh, 
its austerity. In other words, the implication is that there was no choice. There was a financial crisis. There was a need to make immense budget savings and benefits was one of the key areas where that could be done. The truth is that first of all, there haven't been a great many savings from what I can see. A lot of it has involved the transfer over from one set of items to another. A lot of it has been pushed off to the community, to families, to emergency rooms, uh, and to even governmental emergency services rather than in the benefit system itself. I don't see that the motivation has been to create a more compassionate, a more caring benefit system and one that actually produces better life outcomes for people. Instead, the motivation is very clearly, I believe, an ideological one. I don't say that in a necessarily critical way because governments have different ideologies. Governments think of social welfare in different ways. And this government and its predecessor have both been remarkably successful in bringing about a revolution in British welfare policy. They have transformed the nature of the system and particularly the underpinnings of it. The problem that I see is not in terms of the worthy objectives. It is true that employment is a key to getting people out of poverty. It is true that the previous system was confused and confusing. It's true that there are efficiencies that have been found. But what's also happened is that the system epitomized by universal credit about which I'll talk more in a moment, but not at all limited to that, is in fact driven by the desire to get across a simple set of messages. The state does not have your back any longer. You are on your own. As Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society. The government's place is not to be assisting people who think they can't make it on their own. The government's place is an absolute last emergency order. So that's left us in no doubt really um, about where we are. You know, the system doesn't have our backs anymore. So we're going to get you thinking about the bigger picture now with a little quiz. So this wee quiz is just to activate some prior knowledge, give you a chance to share some of your knowledge via the chat with the other participants. And don't worry, there's no competitive pressure at all. It's just for fun. Um, you can just note down what you think if you prefer not to type it in the chat. It's just for you. But we would like you to share your ideas with the other participants in the chat, if at all possible. So this session as a whole is about poverty. But we feel it's really important to start off by looking at wealth. Um, this is, but the quiz focuses on wealth because wealth and poverty are very much two sides of the same coin, as are myths and reality, and we'll come on to that later. As a society, we're always very quick to scrutinise people living in poverty and you know, to make assumptions about how they got there, you know, maybe they didn't work hard enough or something, but we seldom see such a rush to scrutinise the wealthy or think about how much or how little they did to earn their wealth. So let's get started. Scotland's richest, how many percent, have more wealth than the bottom, how many percent put together? So answers in the chat there for that one. Um, 
an, an Oxfam report shows um, the growth of global inequality and Scotland's no exception there. So globally, 82% um, sorry, the richest 1% own 82% of the world's wealth. And in Scotland, Scotland's richest 1% have more wealth than the bottom 50% put together. So, you, this, um, you know, this is probably, according to the Oxfam report, due to excessive corporate influence on policy making, the erosion of workers' rights, and a drive to minimise costs in, in order to maximise returns. So that's, um, that's contributing to that um, huge wealth gap there. So next one, how much total wealth for the top three wealthiest families in Scotland? And you might want to take a wild guess about who they are and what they do. So how much total wealth there? Well, I can tell you that the total wealth for the top three families, top three wealthiest families, is 4.986 billion. So let's see who they are. We have, um, first of all, um, Anders Povelson. So um, he, and this is a fashion, fast fashion empire here. Um, he's the largest shareholder in the online retailer ASOS. Um, also bestseller, Jack and Jones and so on. So, you know, wondering about the ethics of fast fashion there. Next up, we have Glenn Gordon and family. Um, if you're fond of whiskey or gin, then you may well be um, contributing to their wealth there. And finally, we have Kieran and John Shaw, who have made their money in pharmaceuticals. So just, that's just giving you a, a quick snapshot of the wealth in Scotland. So thinking about our current circumstances, who's become Become wealthier during the pandemic. So just take a moment and take a guess on that one. Maybe you want to say specific people, maybe you want to say specific kinds of people. So the irony is not lost on us with this one. Eric Ewan, the founder of and CEO of Zoom, um, he's made over 12 billion since March. Um, when we were do putting this together, we had to keep going back and checking the figures because it seemed actually ridiculous. Um, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, um, he's been the world's richest person since 2017. He's got even richer during the pandemic. There was one day in May where he um, made an additional 10 billion. The final phase might be might not be so familiar. This is Rupert Soames. He's CEO of the outsourcing company Serco. So um, Serco, amongst other things, run the um, COVID-19 test and trace and have also made an obscene amount of money from, from running immigration detention centres. So Let's look at the other side of the coin then. You know, we often hear these stories about how much, you know, how much the poor are costing the country and so on. Um, never mind what this lot are doing, they're questionable tax affairs. But does anybody know in Scotland how much money in benefits goes unclaimed every year? I'll give you a clue there. For Edinburgh alone in 2018, it was 80.9 million. So how much in Scotland? The answer to this one is actually, we don't know exactly. 
Um, the Scottish Parliament's Social Security Inquiry are, have been taking evidence on this and in the resource pack that you'll be able to access after the session, you can have a look at the, um, the SPICE briefing document which looks at a lot of the evidence that they have seen there and, and considers some of the and the reasons why that this might be happening. And those of us who were around for um, the previous module that we did will know th um, that in one school alone, they've had a, um, a financial inclusion worker who's enabled those parents in that school to claim £189,000 in their, their own entitlements. So, Let's look at some numbers. I'll just give you a moment to look at those. So the statistics here highlight the scale of the problem, but the, what they don't touch on is how this impacts on the lives of those whose options are limited by living on a low income. So I would point you towards the the research by the Poverty Truth community that will be passing on to you in the resource pack there um, to look at some of those issues. And I mean, the figures are really, really quite stark there. And in the absence of significant policy change, this figure is likely to increase in the coming years with Scottish government forecasts indicating that it could reach 38% by 2030 to 31. And we know that some groups of people have a higher risk of poverty than others. For example, in 2014 to 2019, people from non-white minority ethnic groups were more likely to be in relative poverty after housing costs compared to those from the white British and white other groups. The poverty rate was 39% for Asian or British Asian ethnic groups. 38% for mixed black, black British and other ethnic groups. And the poverty rate amongst the white other group was 25% and that of the white British group was 18%. So that certainly hints at the, the structural racism that we all know exists in our society. Poverty is also a gendered issue with 39% of single women with children living in poverty. Disability prevents um, present similar barriers. 29% of those who live with a disabled household member live in poverty. So, after those figures, what are the day-to-day -day effects of poverty on families? As we know, children tend to see everything through the lens of their relationships and particularly the experience of their parents and others in their own household. And um, all of these statistics, by the way, are going to be made available to you in the, the Scottish Government figures that we're including in the resource pack. So, um, the Scottish Government res research shows that 51% of parents report that they don't have a small amount of money to spend each week on themselves. 10% of parents can't afford to have their children's friends round for tea or a snack once a fortnight. And we also know that children from higher income families significantly outperform those from low income households at ages three and five. And you can read into this a wee bit more in the, the Growing Up in Scotland survey and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation research that we're making available to you. So let's take a look at the long term consequences of poverty. At age five, children and families in the highest 20% of earners were around 13 months ahead in their vocabulary compared with children in the bottom 20% of earners. So, you know, that's, that's important, that's significant. Let's look even longer term. A girl born in 2018 in one of the 10% most deprived areas of Scotland would have a life expectancy 10 years shorter than a girl from the most affluent area. A boy born in 2018 in one of the 10% most deprived areas of Scotland 
would, would have a life expectancy 13 years shorter than a boy from the, more, from the most affluent area. And I mean, this is, this is all before the pandemic and we can't forget the, the huge impact on COVID deaths of people living in areas of deprivation. So, in spite of these facts, there are a lot of myths that exist around poverty. We're going to spend just a few minutes taking a look at some of those. So the first, there's no real poverty in the UK. Poverty in the UK is dif different from the poverty you get in the, the third world. Children in this country don't go without the basic necessities like food and clothing. So when people are saying this to us, you know, so we can counter that by saying, well, actually nearly four million children in the UK are, are living in poverty. And the UK has one of the worst child poverty records in the, the industrialised world. 1.7 million children in the UK go without basic necessities like food and clothing. And families face choices between basics such as adequate heating and sufficient food. Here's another. Economic growth at the top of our society will benefit every, everyone. Well, that's the fallacy of trickle-down economics. And we just need to look at the people we just saw in the wealth quiz and contrast that with the people in our daily lives. Here's another. Work gets people out of poverty. People can get out of poverty if they get a job, but they choose not to. Hmm. I bet you're all just screaming now. Rubbish. Um, indeed, there are five unemployed people for every job vacancy. Many poor families can't work because of illness, disability, or because there are simply no jobs available where they live. Um, there's also a lack of good quality, affordable childcare in many areas. And in any case, more than half of children in poverty have parents in work, but they're caught up in the cycle of low pay, and in some cases, no pay. Another, people have large families in order to claim benefits. That's one we've probably all heard, but, you know, actually just 34% of children in poverty live in families with three or more children. But children in large families are 50% more likely to be poor. And anyway, the rich have large families too, and they're subsidised in many other ways. For example, private schools with charitable status, subsidised dining, and the taxpayer picking up the bill for expenses. So maybe it's this other myth then that the poor spend all their money on unhealthy habits like gambling, cigarettes, alcohol. And you know, if you give poor families more money, they'll spend it on themselves and not their children. Well, I think we're, we're all aware that you know, from the, the families we've worked with, that parents living in poverty actually put the needs of their children first. We've got parents missing meals so they can, they can feed their children. And I mean, we know from years of research that addiction doesn't respect class or status. It just becomes much more visible when you're poor. And actually it's not the poor who are the biggest consumers of alcohol. It's the middle classes, it's some of us. And there's a really interesting Morag trainer paper that we're going to refer you to in the resource pack where you can look at some more of the research around that. Morag trainer also counteracts this myth that children growing up in poverty have no aspirations. But actually the poverty of aspiration is a myth that transfers responsibility for aspirations and for achievement from governments and schools to parents and children. School is very important to children who are living in poverty and all parents want the best for their children. But lower income parents are less likely to know what's possible or how to achieve it. Here's the greatest myth of all. 
we're all in this together. As we've said before, we, we might be all in the same storm, but we're definitely not all in the same boat. So I'd just like you to think just for a moment now about who creates and sustains these myths. Cui bono, who does it benefit? Type just a few words in the chat now, um, just two or three words just to say who you think might create and sustain these myths, just so you can have a chance to share your ideas with the other participants. I'm left thinking though, what can we do about this? Well, firstly, we can examine our own agency and we can make choices. So let's look at this more closely. Back to you, Kate. Thank you, Sandra. So we've looked at two sides of the same money coin, if you like, at wealth and in poverty. And we've looked at two sides of the reality coin, at myths and what I would term truth. So let's turn now to two sides of the same human worth and dignity coin. Charity or rights? In particular, human rights, for not all rights are human rights. And here we're talking about human rights. Rights we're entitled to just because we are human. And in some cases, also further additional rights because of our additional vulnerabilities or needs. Children be the case in point. We'll talk more about the special nature of human rights shortly. But for now, let us reflect that charity in relation to human needs is only necessary when those rights, those needs are being violated. And let's look at what happens when you ask why. Many of you will be familiar with this quote from a Brazilian Archbishop a number of years ago. When I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. This image accompanying it is also a famous image which was taken um, in the 1930s uh, depression in the Dust Bowl in, in, in the US. The next one is an image around the same time in Glasgow. You might want to take a moment to look at that. I think this picture also paints a thousand rats. And, and the next picture is from our times. It may look different, but poverty isn't always so visible anymore, although in an increasing number of ways it is. For example, Sam just talked about um, uh, the number of single parents in, in poverty, and this woman may be a single payment on starvation benefits, because effectively that's what basic benefits are for many, and whether she's in work or not, and with all the added pressure that both of these situations bring. So what's changed? Well, another thing that hasn't changed is the gendered nature of poverty, Sandra also referred to earlier. The majority of adults in poverty then were women, and the majority of adults in poverty now are women. And we'll look at more of that in, in the next module. So once again, cui bono? Whose interest does it suit for charity to pick up the tab again and again? To be this week's heroes. And remember when we were all clapping for last week's heroes, when we were asked to clap for our NHS heroes. And watch how the narrative changes when that second question here is asked. When we ask why are children starving? Even here in Scotland, where our government is funding the holiday school meals, but malnutrition related diseases are on the rise again, as they are across the UK now, to varying degrees. Let's remind ourselves, for example, about a very visible face of charity, about food banks. The food bank model relies on the notion of charity, and that's not to criticise people who are doing amazing work or those who donate, but once again, cui bono, whose wider interests do food bank serves? Here's another way of looking at the need for emergency food aid, because effectively that is what food banks are. We've talked before um, about that name sort of makes them seem normal, just like having a bank in, on your street corner, although that's becoming increasingly difficult for people in poorer communities too. But essentially this should be termed emergency food aid. So here's another way of looking at the need for that emergency food aid, and one that emphasises dignity, equality and solidarity. So we've given an example before from um, our partners and friends in, in Castle Milk, um, but this is really just an example um, because we have been working with folk in the area, but it really is um, an example that could be, you know, um, that is happening across Scotland where communities are rallying around to support people. 
So this particular image and the details here was taken from uh, Castle Lock Care and Shade and Care rather Facebook page from before the lockdown. Um, and we talked in a previous module about some of the things that they're actually doing now. But we particularly liked one of the quotes from this, but it says, food should be a charity. It's what keeps us alive and should be given freely. We do that for each other all the time in our homes, our schools and our workplaces. This is simply bringing it out onto our street. Don't let capitalist greed take away our basic human needs. Share and care is the way forward. And we welcome the support of and then they've gone to list various community organisations, including one of the local primary schools. And they go on to say, but most of all, all of us who live in the community, let's stick up for each other. So we talked before about the importance of community and the place. So these community activists here are telling a different narrative, an older universal narrative of people having a right to dignity and to share equally in the resources of their community with everyone else and a narrative that essentially underpins the concept of human rights. It is one that we would argue that food banks have flipped to, to render the same people who could contribute and feel part of this to actually to be seen as objects of charity. So should they, and also our school pupils, our learners, be objects of charity? And in the last case, what narrative do we choose to tell our children in school about this? Through both word and deed. Charity or rights? We talk and teach about the rights of the child, and yet there is such a thing as the cost of the school day. We'll be coming back to that thought soon, but for now, let's try deconstructing the narrative a wee bit more. We do flipped classrooms, so how about this flipped narrative? Wouldn't it be great if schools and hospitals had all they need and the army had to hold jungle sales to buy guns and bombs? This was actually on um, a postcard from the 1970s that is even more relevant today um, than perhaps it's ever been. So which are the objects of charity now, which are not, and why? How much do you think the army would raise here? And how different would our schools look without the need for charity? And how do we go about changing that? So to return to the slide that we had at the beginning, charity or rights, but we're asking now, which side are you on? Well, thanks to Florence Reese, who wrote the famous song that this quote is based on, and to Woody Guthrie, who made it famous by, by singing it. Which side are you on? And, and yes, it is a side. There are situations where rights are appropriate and those where charity can step in. But which situation should a school be? Let's look at that more now. Sandra will show you the perspective of one school we've been working with. Um, and in that school, as in all schools, it's a process, a journey, and everyone will be at different stages. So over to you, Sandra, for looking in a minute. Thank you, Kate. So, um, as you know, if you've seen us before, we, we've been working on quite a long-term basis with a, a Glasgow school, Bella Houston Academy, who have been doing a lot of soul searching really and looking at their, their approaches to the cost of the school day. So I, will, I want to just share a, a four minute or so clip here where um, we see some of their ideas about that. This all started because as a young boy growing up in Mary Hill, uh, I remember, this was years ago, so prices have changed. Uh, there was a trip to Germany for £70. And I went home to my dad and I showed him the letter. And my dad said, we haven't got money. And I was like, what? What do you mean we have no money? I've never noticed. And the school made me realise that I was poorer than other children. The school, the place that should be safe, caring, they were the people that made me feel poor for the first time in my life, and that's wrong. A, ch a child shouldn't realise they're poor because the school have asked for money. Firstly, as a teacher, for me, education should be accessible for everybody, and that every young person should have an excellent standard of education, regardless of their family background or whether their parents or carers can afford that. 
um, and that's as a consequence that's why we don't charge any young people for any of their learning experiences. <laughs> Because poverty is a hard rut, um, and, and in our culture, quite often it's stigmatised. Um, and so, I just wondered if you thought much about that. About in some schools, you have to pay quite a bit for the uniform. Like, okay. I would say we're fortunate we have something called blazing squad in this school. Okay. Where if your blazer is too small or if it's too long, right, instead of having to buy another one, you could just swap it. But in some schools, you have to pay for it, and maybe that's too much for a few individuals. Um, and also, they say, um, I know a school where you have to pay for your own jotters. You don't get them provided from the school. Um, at that point, by the end of the year, you can thank this many jotters from each individual subject. So at the end of the day, you'll be being quiet there. I think this is a total blind spot for many teachers and for many schools. The idea of charging children shouldn't even exist. We should not be charging children for anything. Schools should be free at the point of delivery. Full stop. He's extremely proud of the fact that we don't charge for universities. We see the government talking about how proud they are of this policy, but yet in some of the poorest areas of Scotland, children and parents are being asked to pay for things at school. That's ridiculous. I think any policy creation and the work done in order to create a coherent document allows you to question things that have been going on for a long time. And I think that's one of the problems in Scotland in that if we're really wanting to change things, we have to look at everything. We have to say, why are we doing this? What's the point of that? And we haven't really done that in Scotland. We've kind of thought, oh, we'll change the curriculum and everything will be better. I think there's lots of areas within the school, uh, the work we do in the school that we need to question now. I, I, I think that every kid that comes to the school is an individual and they should be treated with respect. And part of the way we can respect them is make them all feel as equal as possible. And I think that can only be if we think about their experience at this place. And we shouldn't make the experience different just because of the money that comes home. For every kid in Scotland, they should be able to access school for free. You know, if every kid in Scotland is going to have the opportunity to be successful in life, they need education. And that shouldn't be hindered by whether they can afford it or not. The whole thing about the cost of the school day, to me, shouldn't even exist. There shouldn't be a cost to the school day. There shouldn't, we shouldn't be having this conversation. There shouldn't be a cost to what families have to pay for their child's education. But yet children in poor areas of the country are being asked to get from the parents' wages to pay for things. It's ridiculous. We need to open our eyes. We need to deal with this properly. We should consign charges to the bin. So that's a snapshot really of where one school is on its journey, you know, in this quite long process of policy development and so on. And we've just put up a few images here just to get you thinking about some of the, the micro payments that, that are arising in schools and the cumulative effect of these can be really, really stressful for parents on low incomes. So from these harsh realities, we are going to ask you now to imagine something different. We're going to send you off to breakout rooms in just a second for about 10 minutes. And we're going to ask you to imagine that your school or setting decides to remove all the costs associated with full participation in school life. And you may be familiar with the concept of a SWOT analysis. We'd love to invite your comments on the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats presented by such an approach. And after your discussion, we're going to ask you to feed back in a number of different ways. Whatever suits you, you can speak to us on camera, which we love. You can feed back in the chat 
or you can choose to send us a fuller response later and we'll then incorporate that into the resources pack that we can send out to people. So Lee is going to send you off to breakout rooms now for 10 minutes and then we'll come back for a feedback discussion. Thanks everyone. Great, well welcome back everyone. Um, as Sandra said, um, there is more than one way to feedback here, so um, if you want to um, contribute in person that would be great. Please raise your hands um, uh, on the, if you look at next to your name. Um, someone with the initial J. Okay, I'm not seeing this and thank you so much. Um, you. I'd like to just un un unmute yourself please and, and feel free to speak. Hi there, I'm Jill yeah. and our group was really we got lost in our conversation so much about it we found a lot of um strengths which were um one of them was op openness that um the the school community was open about what was happening about money and that there was the strong strongest strength was fairness that everybody started from the basis that it wasn't going to cost them anything to be at school yes. um, we were really keen on notions of transparency for budget and or shared some experiences of um, inequality even between staff of knowing what money there was and where it was and what it was to be spent on. Um, we talked about the judgments that we wouldn't need to make about children and whether or not they'd brought a pencil or not brought a pencil because they could afford it or because they couldn't be bothered, that kind of thing of just there's not an issue to, to start with. Um, we talked about the possibility that it changes the social pecking order that the, the children don't need to although it can can't completely eradicate it that, that there are uh, fewer opportunities in school for status around money a little bit few, a, a little few um, and we also talked about the potential for young people to experience to have a political education if they experience within school something that's more fair and equal that then they wouldn't be um, it wasn't that they're then they would still be going home to an unequal society but that they would have had an experience of how to make that work and the benefits of it for all of them not um which is different from the charity version of it and we discussed one threat which was about getting buy-in or not getting buy-in from parents oh um, that's so interesting thank you so much and on that last one i know that sandra has something coming up on that very point so thank you so much that's was really interesting contributions i can see nika has got a hand up hello nika hi well of course i'm gonna get get my hand up uh, i think in in our group we covered some of the points that judith has just said but one other aspect um we talked about was you know like meeting the basic needs of the children in our schools, the focus is so much on attainment that we sometimes forget that to get to that that point, there are basic needs that need to be met. And if we have no cost attached and we take away the cost, then all of these needs could be, the money could be spent to make meet those needs so the children can then achieve and attain. And we talked about Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs pyramid to say, if we're trying to put money at a higher point in that pyramid without actually taking care of the, the basics at the base of the pyramid, that's not going to stick, it's not going to be effective, it's just going to fall down. So it's just a little bit short-sightedness of why we're putting money without taking the whole picture in, in place and, and making uh, actually valuing where the money is going, even if we're thinking attainment in the long term, that kind of like um, discussion because that's, that's that's so interesting these are really two great contributions thank you both so much and, and we'll make sure that obviously these views are, are shared both in the recording and um in uh, the, the resources that we, we send out um, I, I can feedback from errors if well please do yes thank yeah. you just just in terms of some of of the the issues that we discussed in, in our group um of course we um all those strains are all you know that everyone has mentioned is ideal the first thing that i thought was where does the the money come from for for that um i've got a background in primary teaching and additional support needs and i we were just chatting about um 
most most trips that I've organised, if not every one of them, wouldn't have been able to go ahead without a t a, some contribution from from the parents. You know, with the school subsidising as much as much as we can. Um, so uh, it's just it's a, a wonderful, wonderful concept and in, in theory, but it, it would need to be backed up because the possibility of not um, the children not getting these experiences would would really be a shame and so um, uh, we, we were just discussing the huge challenge of of the school being able to fund that without without any parent contribution okay and that's really important points as well thank you so much nicola that's great well thank you so let's head into a wee five minute comfort break and can i remind you just to try um, and grab a, a sheet of a4 paper or similar just something to write on and while you're there thank you we'll see you in five minutes so welcome back everyone. Um, we start off the second part of the session by reminding you of a thought we'd raised pre previously um, which we took from a comment originally posted online about the media but we think it's useful for us too and so useful that we actually want to um, use this to uh, title this session. So the quote was if someone says it's raining and another person says it's dry it's not your job to quote them both. Your job is to look out of the window and find out which is true. However, on the other hand, it needs to be said that drowning doesn't always look like drowning. So in these current times, we don't think it's just raining. We think that we need to check out the downpour. And we've actually even updated the picture that we're using here to try and reflect that. Because what was rainfall before the pandemic is now a storm. And some of us, metaphorically and literally, don't even have an umbrella or a raincoat. So I'm going to pass you over to Sandra, who's going to give just one more example of what goes on in that downpour. Thank you, Sandra. So on top of everything else, the, the long term poverty issues compounded by the issues of the pandemic, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it turns out that actually it's really expensive to be poor. So the poverty premium is a term used to describe how poor people pay more for essential goods and services compared to those who are not in poverty. And it, I'm just highlighting here the, the paper from the University of Bristol, which we're including in the resources pack. Um, so in, in the UK, the poverty premium has been highlighted as an important social policy concern by charities and organisations working with low income families. And those on low incomes pay so much more for the things we all need to survive. Fuel, telecommunications, insurance, accessing cash, accessing credit. And uh, the Bristol study estimates that the average cost of the poverty premium is £490 per household per year. But for many, it's much, much higher because there is an uneven distribution here. So, how does this happen? I, just a few things here from the paper just to, to draw your attention to it. Um, number one, the, the use of prepayment meters. Um, in low-income low households. It's much higher than the best available tariff. Um, secondly, the non-standard non methods of bill payment, like paying on receipt of a bill, paper bills, monthly payments for home insurance, car insurance and so on, are much higher than making the, the one-off annual payment. Some families are not switched to the best fuel tariff. Um, it can be very difficult to make those savings if you don't have the time and the energy to consider these things. Um, Area-based premiums are really significant as well. There is a shopping premium where if it's very hard to find good value shops in your area for food shopping, grocery shopping, you, it's, it's an additional pressure there. Um, and this is particularly um, true in rural communities as well. Um, there's also an additional premium for living in a more deprived or you know what's considered a high crime area if you're looking for car insurance insurance. Again, issues of insurance of individual items. If people are taking out multiple 
insurances for mobile homes, kitchen appliances and so on because they don't have a good price for home insurance, then that's an other premium. And access to money itself is a very important one there. Um, use of fee charging cash machines, which are more common in areas of deprivation and, and, pre and prepaid cards or um, subprime credit cards, as they're called, which give really, really detrimental rates there. And of course, use of high cost credit, like um, rent to own stores, such as Bright House, um, and also things like um, payday loans and doorstep lenders. And I mean, this is all, as with so many poverty issues, this is, these are all ideological choices that companies have made to increase their wealth, making money from the poor. Um, and as teachers, we can, we can often feel, we're recognizing this and feeling but what can we do about this? Can we do anything about this? Can we even teach about this? Or, you know, will we, will we be accused of perhaps being too political? Well, you know, education is a political act after all. But actually, we do have permission to do something. And to address these social justice issues is really enshrined in our standards. And it, if we've actually mapped the packed outcomes against these standards. And so, I mean, the, the GTCS points out um, that social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political and social rights and opportunities. So we can teach about this, we absolutely can. If we look at our refreshed narrative um, in terms of curriculum for excellence, you can see that Every area here that we're aiming to include in our teaching is actually threatened and undermined by poverty. Um, so this is both at the school level and the department level and the classroom level. And if we go using our existing pedagogical narratives here to the pupil level, we can see that every indicator on the wellbeing wheel here is actively undermined and threatened. By, by poverty. And these narratives are already in, embedded in our work, but there's another really important one that we want to consider. It's one that unifies and enhances all of these. So back to Kate for an activity based on this. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there's actually um, a polls item there, and we're hoping to do a short poll here or to be more accurate, three short polls. Um, so if you can click on that button now, you should be able to see the first of these polls. So there's just three questions there. Um, your individual answers are confidential, so please feel free to be um, as uh, open as, as you feel you would want. And that um, what we will do um, is we will share the general results um, at the end of the polls, but there is nothing here that can identify you. So please do take your time and answer these questions. If you click on the polls button at the bottom, um, uh, does everyone have it? Um, I'm seeing one or two people can't see it. Um, so sorry if, if that's the case, if it's, if it's not up, oh, I'm hoping it's come up now. If there is anyone um, because of the tech that you're using that it hasn't come up, please do send us a separate message and we will send it to you um, after the session. It looks like most people have got it now. You don't need to, it's just really your first thoughts here, you don't need to give this a lot of thought. It's very much a snapshot um, that, that we're hoping to take for the moment. But I can see that almost all of you have voted um, and I don't see any more coming in. So perhaps we will end that one, please. Thanks, Lee, and move on to the next one. Thank you so much. Again, I can see that a similar number have voted. So if we could close that poll, please. And then um, when you're ready, Lee, let's share the results from poll one. So going back to the art of ignoring the rights of the poor, 
Um, this uh, quote originally was um, a, a title of a talk given by uh, Ruth Lister, um, who is well known in the, the poverty field, um, at a conference I went to last year, and I was quite struck by it, so I hope she doesn't mind me boring it. But she had talked about the art of ignoring the rights of the poor. Sorry, the art of, of ignoring the poor, rather. I'm talking about the art of ignoring the human rights of the poor. Um, I spent many years as, as an academic um, anti-poverty and human rights researcher after moving on from my um, uh, practitioner and community activist roles. Um, and I would say that it is actually an art to ignoring the rights of the poor. That if you actually examine not only the way that human rights are presented in, in the literature, but also in, in academia and in many research papers, that, that you can't inevitably, I would argue that many people would come to the same conclusion that I came to as a researcher. But in some cases, the, you can only say that, that it does seem to be an, an act of camouflage at times. Um, sometimes accidentally the language is confusing, people who use different conceptual um, and philosophical theories and frames of reference, but at sometimes it seems very clear to me at least that um, there is a deliberately politically based, perhaps or ideologically based camouflage going on. So, um, and a lot of people have even written papers about how confusing it is. So for those of you it's confusing, as I said, you're not alone. So what this confusion and neglect of human rights results in in terms of uh, for us as educators, is that the whole body of work in human rights education, and there is a whole body of work, gets lost in the fog. Those who would take it forward don't know about it, and those who want to and, and who don't know, know about it don't know where to start to take it forward. So we will be signposting you to some resources in, in the resource pack that you'll get it out um, shortly after the session. And we're still working on that, but we'll get it out to you as soon as possible. And there are particularly some uh, Scottish-based resources that you will be, I think you'll be very interested in. But let's start with what we do know just now. Um, and first, going back to the importance of understanding the, 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 the narrative that's around human rights, in which um, our educational um, aspirations and the Convention of the Rights of the Child is based. So let's, let's have a look in, and start with this. So this, a major theme that's surfaced again and again in our work so far, has been the importance of coherence and buy-in from everyone, if a whole school offer is to have any real meaning. There needs to be a shared narrative about where we've been, where we're going and how we may get there. So this picture here is Eleanor Roosevelt holding um, the very early print of, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you're all familiar with. So Eleanor knew this and is the prime mover behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She knew the importance of a shared narrative. And this narrative here, in that declaration relies on a powerful moral imperative of stating shared values and aspirations, much like our educational narratives. She said, um, and let's have a look at a famous quote from her, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen in any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighbourhood they live in, the school or college they attend, the factory, farm or office where they work. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, in the school or college they attend. So picking up on some of the earlier themes and discussion points, what human rights narratives do we have in our schools and colleges? So essentially, as we know, in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and, and rights respecting schools and um, other um, manifestations of, of learning and, and teaching about these rights. But how much do we understand where that comes from in terms of its human rights context? We're all familiar with it and as an educational framework, but um, are we familiar with it in its human rights framework? So let's start to go on to the next slide. Thank you, Sandra. So let's start with this. In the beginning was the declaration. In 1948, obviously just after World War II, the nations, um, uh, many nations of the earth came together to say never again and to enshrine what we know um, of, of aspirations and moral values and that moral imperative in the declaration. 
Perhaps it's not so obvious now, but Britain and the United States were actually prime movers in this, but it was Eleanor Roosevelt who made it happen. However, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has one major problem in that it's not legally binding. So from it over the years came a number of treaties to make that possible. So let's look at the next slide. So you can see that the, the, you can change them into sort of three broad groups. So we have the International Covenants, which were many years in, in the making and which um, came into force in 1976. There are two covenants there, which are, um, so the, one of the principles of human rights, as many of you will know, is that they are indivisible. You don't cherry pick the rights. One right depends on another and all, they all come as a set, if you like. But for lots of political shenanigans and ideological reasons that I won't go into just now, they were separated into two covenants, um, which came into force, as I say, in 1976. So we have the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is the main document, main covenant concerned with poverty related rights. And we have its sister covenant, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. There is some overlap, but they're broadly um, divided into these kind, these kind of rights. So the UK has signed and ratified both of these. And we're going to talk a wee bit more, and I'm going to give you a wee bit more information about the covenant and economic, social and cultural rights. And once again, this is a lot of information to take in. You don't have to remember it. You'll get it all um, and references along with it in the resources pack. This is to contextualise and try and defog it for you just by giving you some main contextual points so that you know what's important here. So together, these two covenants and the declaration make up what's called the International Bill of Rights, a very foundational document. But we also have, as you can see, the regional treaties, some of which actually came into force even before the covenants, because all this work took years and years and years with lots of states arguing and, and trying to debate and negotiate these things. So obviously for our purposes, um, geographically, um, the regional treaties um, would be the European treaties. So some of them from the Council of Europe and subsequently the EU, um, for example, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms and um, the one that um, we've all heard of, the European Convention on Human Rights. It's worth saying that the European Convention on Human Rights, in spite of its name, which seems to suggest that either that's all human rights or um, if it's not in there, it's not a human right, is actually mainly civil and political rights in the same way that we have a covenant that is in civil and political rights. That became domesticated as the Human Rights Act in, in the UK, brought into domestic law. Um, and of course that's under threat and has been under threat for a few years now from the current government who are quite blatant um, about their unhappiness with it. The other ones have not been brought into domestic law, um, but the covenants are binding under international law. So um, we're going to say a wee bit more about that in a moment. And of course, just returning to the European Convention on Human Rights, our devolved parliament in Scotland, the Scotland Act requires compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So the third sort of grouping, all of these events, you know, along the way, different journey stops, different um, versions of things, but really all came from the declaration initially. And the, the third group there is specific groups who are given um, particular attention um, and, and, and specific human rights documents because of their vulnerabilities and additional needs, as I mentioned. So the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child is one of those. The Convention on uh, the Rights of People with Disabilities is another, and there are others. So um, and there are also um, types of rights that we're seeing as time went on to need extra attention. So, for example, um, the, the prohibition um, on torture is one of them, and there are, there are other ones there as well. So, broadly speaking, if you get that kind of division, then you've got a really good kind of framework, hopefully to understand it and perhaps to take it um, into the classroom. So let me just tell you a wee bit more. We'll just go into the next slide. So in terms of focusing on the, um, the International Covenant Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as the main foundational document about poverty, although all these other ones have poverty related things as well, um, we need uh, states, uh, i.e. the UK government who signed up and ratified this, are called upon to respect, to protect and to fulfil the rights that are in that. And they're called upon to do these with rights generally, but as I say, we're focusing on this one at the moment. And they're called upon to do it in a certain way. So if you like to thank you. So for political reasons, one would argue, many argue, I agree with this, um, that people were not uh, told to sign up to this, the states weren't told to go off and, you know, do these rights right away that I'm just going to come on to. But it might be difficult for some that was agreed. So let's have the, the principle of progressive realisation. So the rights that I'm going to tell you in the wee moment are supposed to be progressively realised. So, so please bear that in mind. And also, 
They're supposed to use the maximum available resources. So governments are not supposed to say they can't afford to realise these rights. They're supposed to prioritise realising these rights. And in addition, there are supposed to be no retrograde measures. It's meant to be progressive realisation. Um, it's about solidifying what is there and continually building on that. However, it's recognised in times of urgency, war is an obvious one, um, and, and perhaps the argument that's coming out just now about the virus um, might, is one that could be trotted forward um, if we were even having a dialogue about human rights, although obviously given the points that, that Sandra and, and others have made earlier, um, that would take a lot of justification to, to actually say that we're not able to actually still progress these rights given that we know where all the money's going, um, but there's supposed to be no retrograde measures without prior justification. So we can contrast this with the, um, the Convention on the Civil and Political Rights, um, where again, for political reasons, uh, people were told to just go off and realise these, but, but the, the ones that surprisingly are about poverty and money were given a kind of special treatment. So let's look at what some of these rights are. I've touched upon these in previous sessions, but I, I'll spell this out again because it's really important and, and for those who are joining us for the first time. So here's some extracts from the Economic, Social and Rights Economic and social and cultural rights covenant. So everyone has the right to an adequate standard of living and the continuous improvement of living conditions, to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, to work and to free choice of employment, to social security, and I should say, um, and also to take part in the cultural life of your country, um, and also that um, the, the work and free choice of employment also includes just and favourable conditions of work. So I'm sure you don't need me to draw out the contrast between these and the reality we see every day. I've referred already to some of the reasons why these um, are, are not acted upon and haven't been brought into domestic law, but also um, public pressure has, uh, that, that, I must say it's starting to increase, but overall public pressure, because people are not aware of it, public pressure has not been able to be brought to bear to demand that these are actually brought into domestic law. So um, the Scottish Government has um, brought in some of these into, into domestic law and is investigating, actively investigating ways to bring more of these into domestic law. And an example of that is the new social security system that is explicitly based upon um, a human rights model and recognises that social security is a human right. So one of the other crucial ways that we could make this real and try to um, uh, take away that gap between what the, the, the UK government has signed up to and goes before, before the United Nations every few years and reports upon and the reality is obviously with the power of education. So let's go back then to human rights education. A great deal has been written on this, as I said before, with programmes underway in many countries in different ways and with different emphasis. But let's start with two foundational documents. If you just give me one moment. Okay. So the World Programme on Human Rights Education is now um, just into its fourth phase, which runs from 2020 to 2024, there have been different phases since 2005, and you'll get more information about this again in the resource pack. Um, unfortunately, we have such limited time now that and we're having to put more materials into the resource pack that we would have given you, talked about face to face. So it's good timing for our purposes that, um, that this new phase has started in 2020, because the focus for this phase is on youth. So in the second foundational document here in terms of HRE, um, Human Rights Education, the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training specifically states in Article 2, which we think is something we said before, but again we're revisiting, the fundamental and now widely accepted principles that human rights education encompasses education about human rights, so that's awareness and details of internationally recognised human rights, as well as um, government's responsibilities to respect, protect and fulfil them. So giving the wider public, but for, for our purpose, specifically young people, facts as well as the understanding that they need to, to be able to um, uh, fully um, um, contextualise them and, and to make use of those. If you don't know your human rights, you can't claim them. And as we said over and over again, the Convention on the Rights of the Child 
is limited in that children don't live in a vacuum, so they're living in families and communities where their adult human rights are, are being violated and equally those children don't stay children in time they become adults and, and if they leave the, their human rights at the school door then we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, what, what, how much worth has that been? It certainly has some worth but um, they need to know about what they're entitled to as adults, as human beings and, and not only as children and that's part of a human rights based approach. So, but, so we teach through human rights um, we're actually doing this pretty well in terms of um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, in terms of how we model the values that, that we're actually communicating. Um, but we teach, why, why is it worth doing this though? We teach for human rights. So purpose, purposeful teaching, this is taken from the Declaration, purposeful teaching and education to enable people of all ages to know their human rights and to be able to de demand and claim them. And this is one of the ways that Sam just talked about that we actually can further put our, our teaching standards into practice and our commitment to social justice and to um, and supporting our young people to take a full part in, in, in society um, during and when they leave school. So let's have a wee look at the next slide. We've got, this is where we're going to ask you to use your A4 sheet. Um, and what we're hoping is that you could write for us just very briefly if you were to send a message to the education system about poverty and human rights what would it be? Ensure everyone pays a fair share of tax so every child can afford to be well nourished physically, intellectually, emotionally and culturally from Lisa, thank you and from NECAP teach children not just about their rights but teach them to demand their rights absolutely um, and from Carol, poverty is a violation of human rights. Human rights education is crucial for young people. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, I, I think I think that's it. Thank you very much. Obviously, feel free to to write anything in as it as it occurs to you. And, and as we've done before, we will um, uh, make sure that the, the chat is made available to you. Um, so. And um, also feel free again if you want to send us anything afterwards. We really, as we'll say a wee bit more in a moment, really want to develop our community. Um, and so we want everyone to, to please take ownership and feel free to contribute. So I'll just pass you back to Sandra. Now. Thank you. So some of you will remember in previous sessions that we touched on this particular elephant in the room class. The class ceiling does exist for sure. Um, and you can read more about that in the resource pack. For now, we're going to try and summarise that in quite a, a creative way with a five minute film featuring um, the poet Tom Leonard and anti-poverty activist Stuart Platt, who's also a filmmaker, and Michael McCann, who you'll see performing in this video. I do have to give a little language warning for the poem, so if you're quite sick, sensitive to swearing. There is a wee swear towards the end so you might want to cover your ears and this could be used as a possible discussion activity to raise issues with colleagues or it could be a classroom activity for senior pupils. So let's get straight in there. And this clip does start with a few seconds of silence so don't worry about that. The audio will come in. I don't ever claim to represent the excluded in any way. I mean, I, you know, but what is often drives me <laughs> from anger into writing, uh, or sometimes from humour and, and then into writing, is a reaction against what is portrayed as the inclusive and isn't inclusive. If you hear a working class voice and you hear someone with an upper middle class voice and they say spot the major and spot the private, it would be hard. If you get into a, if you get into a, a courtroom and you hear somebody speaking in a broad city voice and you hear somebody speaking with an upper middle class voice, who's the judge and who's the accused? Right enough, my language is disgraceful. My 
My mom helped me. My teacher helped me. The doctor helped me. The priest helped me. My boss helped me. My landlady in Carrington Street helped me. The last day I tried to get halfway in 1969 to help me. Some wee smout that thought I had near a Chomsky to help me. A Calvinistic communist that thought I was a revisionist to help me. Poor faced literati grimly carrying the burden of the past to help me. Poor faced literati grimly carrying the burden of the future to help me. My wife tilt me just to get into this poem tilt me. My wains came home for school and tilt me. Just about every book I open tilt me. Even the introduction to the Scottish National Dictionary tilt me. Oh well, all living language is sacred. Fuck a lot of them. exploration of class to another and how it impacts on the schools. I think it was Nicola who brought up the issue of like, what's the parent's reaction, you know, and that's such an important question. Do the parents buy into these zero cost cultures or as in one school that we know, do we get the question, what happened to the ski trip? So in this particular primary school, uh, fantastic new head teacher came in who was really really aware of the the inequalities in in the school and in this area where there's there is hidden poverty and um, she really wanted to change the culture of the school to be more inclusive and she faced a massive middle class backlash which um, started off from the parent council because you know as, as we might have noticed um, middle class parents and particularly well almost all white middle class parents dominate parent councils and they inevitably want to maintain the status quo that benefits them and, and there's extensive research about how and why this happens and it, uh, just to have a really brief look, because we are approaching the end of our time today, but don't worry, we're going to do a lot more work on class in the next module. This just gives you a flavour. Um, we had to um, take the brave step of venturing into the Mumsnet comments. And if you don't know Mumsnet, then... Oh, um, we could, it's been a really good insight for us into the thinking of the parents who maybe don't speak like me or don't, um, you know, don't really speak to me in the playground. I've anonymised them all here. And so these parents are discussing a £1,500 primary school ski trip. So, you know, some of them are you know, saying like, you know, why they even do this? I'll just let you read these over for a second. But, you know, the pointing out it is prohibitively expensive for many people. But, you know, um, it just shows how the other half live, really, for many parents. Um, you know, it's trips like this 
which is why I've started a savings account for my dear daughter from birth. God, so many trips. Don't they ever do any work? Dear daughter won sports matches, take her out of school and off. I think I'll offer her £500 to stay at home. Can you imagine? Um, it was on, you know, um, basically um, unconscious bias in action here. And we'll just reflect on this last point. It's optional. Anyone who thinks it's too expensive doesn't have to go. For what it's worth, £1,500 for guaranteed snow strikes me as better value than £900 for Austria and poor or no snow. If it was compulsory, I would understand it. I would understand the issue. It isn't. Hmm. So this is just dipping our toe in here to see what we're up against. So we will come back to class in much more detail in the next module. But for now, we're going to have a think about building the packed community. And um, if you were around for the launch of the project, you'll know that we're, we're really keen on exploring people, places and power. And before we talk specifics here for our final thoughts, we just want to remind you, remind everyone and ourselves of, of something that we've learned, something that we know. So picking up and, and your understandable um, uh, enthusiasm to take this forward, but recognising that, um, you know, um, that there may be barriers or difficulties and some of them have touched upon tonight, some of them will continue to discuss. Um, we all know that there's no magic wand here, um, but we all know um, that we can all make choices and there are areas where we can all exercise our agency. But equally, it's no rocket science. It's no rocket science either. Well, we're all on a learning journey. We do know that there are places where we can start now to exercise that agency to varying degrees, but there are all there are things that we can all do. And obviously that's for you to decide what those things are. And we can all plan how to go further in terms of our own our personal goals, our professional goals, and in terms of together as, as the PACT community. So bearing both of these in mind, let's finish off with three practical things here as we come to the end of our session. So the first on communication and peer learning and that sense of ownership that we, we want to support here. Um, we wanted to uh, reflect on the fact that obviously we um, set some homework for those who were able um, and wanted to take that on board at the last session. We're also aware that um, we really do want um, more feedback if you want to give us it from the breakout rooms that we have in our sessions, including today's. And so, because it's important to be heard and it's important to feel that the work that you're putting into something is being heard and being shared. So just to reiterate, we'll post the recording, we'll circulate comments from the chat and do please, please send us your feedback from the breakout rooms and similarly on from your homework from last session. So just to remind you, or for those who weren't there, the suggestion was obviously for those who are able to do it, we recognise all the demands in your time, and to either start a conversation about poverty with colleagues in your school, or use the, the uh, CPAG resource of this cost of the school day, which is in the resource pack from the last module, which is now available on the website for those who haven't picked up on it yet, um, to make one change in your classroom or in your school. We've had some feedback already, really valuable feedback about conversations that have been started and changes that have been proposed um, and uh, some of the difficulties and barriers that have to be overcome. So we're really keen to hear more. Um, so we're hoping to, I'm not hoping, planning to um, start a blog, which we're hoping to be available between modules two and three. And we want to populate that with your comments as well as um, sharing it in the other ways that I've just said. So we do also have some homework for this session. For those, again, who have the time and who want to take this forward, this is about your ownership and Sandra's just going to tell you a bit more about that now. Yeah, we do recognise that things are just horrible in schools at the moment. You, so we're not giving you anything onerous at all and it is completely optional. But we would like you to consider using one of the films that we use today just to start a discussion maybe in a staff WhatsApp group, WhatsApp group or if you're having a, a meeting on Teams, you might share one of these short films just to get that conversation going. And of course, you can feed back to us with how that goes at the next module in two weeks time. 
back to Kate for the final point here. Okay, so thank you. Um, we're, we're just um, in the, 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 the final um, few sentences here, but I wanted to ask you about something again. This is your community. We're supporting you to develop this. And uh, we've had um, a lot of discussion, obviously, about language and narrative. We've had some of it today, and we'll continue to have that through the modules because we think it matters. Um, and Sandra and I obviously discuss this quite a lot about how we want to, to um, use those communication mediums and skills and tools um, to best communicate the ideas and, and the information that we're giving you. So one of the things that came up in our discussion was a brilliant idea, I think, um, that Sandra came up with. So credit to Sandra, I'm, I'm just telling you. And we wanted to um, ask you, for some people this might be appropriate, for some people you might not want to, but it's fine. We want to know what you think about the word Pactivists, are we pactivists? That combination of pact and activists. Um, and we just wanted to throw that out for people just to tell us in the chat whether you like that, just your intuitive response, or whether you don't like it. Um, and uh, it would be nice to hear. So do you want to um, put stuff in the chat if you're happy to do that? If you don't want to, that's fine. Okay, great. So that works for Lisa, brilliant. Does anyone else want to share what they think? Yep, good. Carol likes it, excellent. It's okay if you don't like it. Yep, other thumbs up there. Thank you, Sharon. Maybe I'll stop reading out names so that you can, if people are, don't like it, I don't want them to feel they're uh, going to read out their names saying they don't like it. You can dislike it if you want. It's absolutely up to you. Okay, so sounds good. I like it. Yes, I like it. Brilliant. Okay, yeah, good point. If it's clear what it means, yes, indeed. Perhaps it, it's, it's pretty clear when you see it on paper, but perhaps we need to think about that for just saying it. Be happy to be called a pactivist. Um, a query where pact comes from. Um, although, obviously, you might think it's, it's the P for poverty and the act for action, and there is a level in which that's true. The main thing is about actually the promise that we're all making together um, to actually do what we can to mitigate the effects of poverty in schools. So it's a pact together to do what we can, a pact, obviously, from the Scottish Government and the EIS to support teachers to do that and funding and supporting the project. But most of all, it's a pact with all of us for our children and young people that we will do everything they can to leave poverty outside the school door. So it's that notion of a, of a, of a serious promise and making a pact together. And um, would work better once you've taken part in pact training and become a pactivist. Indeed, yes, absolutely. It's something that people can choose to adopt when they feel confident to do that, but great. Um, and I see Nicola's heading off. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you for your kind comments. Thank you for coming. Um, so thank you everyone for all of that. So all that remains to do now is to say um, thank you once again. It's been a delight and a joy to hear your views and goodbye for now from me. And goodbye from me. Thank you for coming, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>